Hello, and welcome to Our Special Lives. I'm Laura McGrath, and today we're continuing our three-part series on coping with difficult emotions. Today, we're going to be tackling the topic of coping with not knowing what's wrong with your child. And before we get started, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and share. Hi, Carrie Ann. Welcome to the show. Hi, Laura. Thank you for having me back. So today, as you know, we're talking about coping with the situation where something is wrong with your child and you don't know what's wrong. And um, when I'm looking out at uh, the special needs parent population, um, I'm seeing that this kind of comes up in two different contexts. One is where you have a nonverbal child and the child is obviously in pain, something is wrong, but they cannot verbally express what's wrong. And you get into a situation where you really don't know how to help them. Um, the second situation that I see is with parents who um, have a child who has some type of ailment or disorder and they've taken them from doctor to doctor and no one can quite figure out what is wrong, um, might be a genetic disorder of some sort, it might be a constellation of symptoms that no one can put together. But in both cases, a parent is in that space of their child is suffering on some level, and they can't figure out how to get the help that they need or how to end the child's suffering. So that's that's the situation. Those right. are the circumstances. Right. As I've shared with you, I've been in this situation many times. It is one of the most emotionally uncomfortable situations that uh, a special needs parent can deal with. And so I thought it would be really helpful for the audience to talk about that today. Absolutely. And I can tell you also from experience, it is an incredibly painful place to be. So as we go through this, I want you to also know that I've been through it as well. Um, a little bit different circumstances than your own, but um, there was a time when Katie wasn't able to speak and she was literally just like crying in pain up every single night. It took months, it took us six months to figure out what was going on. Um, and it was probably one of the most frustrating, scary, um, exhausting experiences of my life. And so I can understand a little bit uh, what people are going through. And so I just want people to know that as we work through this, because there's really no magic, there's no magic wand to take away all of the different things that you're experiencing, nor would you want to, frankly. Um, and so we're going to get to why at kind of more near the end of it. But what I thought would be really helpful for your viewers would be to actually walk you through an experience. And so for those of you watching, if you know, you can even think of the own, you know your own experience, the own time when you have gone through um, something like this, and just kind of follow along what we're doing. And you can even write down like the questions to the answers that I'm asking Laura because it might help you kind of process some of this. And at the end, I'm going to tell you why I, I want everyone to kind of see this process. Does that sound sounds sound good? Great. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. All right. We ready? Yes. Okay. So I first, I'd like you to, to maybe think about a circumstance or situation uh, where this has been the case for you and just talk to me a little bit about the circumstance. What was okay. going on? So I'm going to talk about it as though it's happening now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, excuse me. So, um, so something's wrong with my son. Mm -hmm. He won't stop crying. And I apologize ahead if I get emotional Try. about this yeah. because it's just, yeah. you know, these situations are very upsetting. They're very overwhelming. Yeah. And so, yeah. it, it, you know, thinking about it kind of brings me back to where brings I was back. when it was going on. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, he won't stop crying. He um, is, you know, even scream crying, uh, you know, like something is very acutely causing him pain. Um, he's, you know, this has been going on for four or five days now. Um, we've taken him to the pediatrician. There's nothing obviously wrong with him. Nothing is broken. Um, his blood levels are all normal. Um, he doesn't have strep throat. He doesn't have an ear infection. Um, there is something that's causing him an enormous amount of pain and we can't figure out what it is. And you know, he's not sleeping. He's needing an incredible amount of pain medication, which is interfering with some of his other medications and not 
um, being able to sleep at night is causing him to have seizures. Okay. And, you know, I'm really in a place where I'm just feeling so um, overwhelmed and scared and just um, anxious and sad. And um, I just don't know what to do. Okay. So what I'm going to have you do, because there's a lot of emotion in there and all of the different emotions are caused by different thoughts and different thought processes. And the reason why it's important to kind of like segregate this is so you can start dealing with one emotion at a time and really look at what's going on behind the emotion. I know that people watching right now are like, well, of course she feel she's feeling like this. Well, of course you are. It's, this is appropriate for you to feel the way you're feeling right? But let's like kind of dig down a little bit. So would you like, let's pick one emotion for us to kind of work through overwhelm, anxious, sad, so I think fear, fear, I think fear, okay. because, uh, and I, and I can kind of tell you like what the fear thoughts are. Is that what yeah, you'd like please. me to do? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, the fear, like one of the, there's like, sorry, there's about like five. Um, mm -hmm. so what if something is really wrong? Um, and, you know, and, and like, you know, he could become very sick or, you know. So, so let me interrupt you. I, yeah. And this is going to be painful and I understand that. But yeah. So when you say, what if, what if something could like, he has really, really could be wrong. What does that look like to you? What does that mean? Very sick. Um, so, you know, one of the things that my brain always goes to is like a twisted intestine, you know, okay. like that's causing him a huge amount of pain. And because we can't figure out what it is, it's something that if it's left, um, you know, undiagnosed, it could actually lead to his death. Okay. Um, you know, some, something like that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. What's another thought? Um, another thought is like that, that watching him suffer is so unbearable and I don't know how I'm going to get through it. So like fear mm -hmm. of not being able to like survive this experience. Okay. Um, you know, what, what if we can't figure out, um, what this is like, how long will he have to suffer? And, and what if this never ends? What if it just keeps going where he's crying every day and not sleeping? And like, what if it never ends like that fear of never ending? Mm -hmm. So those are the big fear thoughts that I have. Okay. I've got other emotions okay. and other thoughts, but those are the big three with fear. Okay. Okay. So now if you can, so you're experiencing this fear based off of these questions and we're going to come back to the thoughts. Okay. Okay. But when you are in fear like this, how, what, what's happening for you in your behavior? How do you show up? What's going on for you? Um, the fear is not helpful. Um, I have some other thoughts that lead to more, more helpful actions, but the fear is really not helpful because I feel frozen. Okay. So, it, so what it, do you do when you're frozen? I basically, it's, it's inaction really. Mm -hmm. Inaction is the action. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so then what happens is you have these thoughts, they lead to the fear, your emotion, that emotion leads to inaction. And what the result is is there's no action, right? Right. There's no moving forward. There's no figuring out. You're just kind of stuck. Yeah. Right. And so you said, and so the, the reason why this is important and why I wanted to do this with you is to remind you, we all need reminding Yeah. <laughs> and, and just to kind of help people that are watching understand that this is really significant because what you're thinking in the moment has a huge impact on what's currently going on in your life right? So the fear is keeping you frozen and you're not moving forward, yeah. right? Which is clearly not what we want. Yeah. Right. And so one of the ways, and I know you said you had some um, other thoughts, some intentional thoughts that will bring you to action, but I want to kind of help people understand what to do with this. 
Yeah. Right. And so if those of you, if you're writing this down, what you do, if you have a question, right? So one of Laura's questions was, well, what if this never ends? So what you need to do is you need to answer that question. Right. Um, and we don't necessarily have to do that right now. I'm just giving people ideas. Um, another, another thing was, what if something is really wrong? And then you gave the example of say a twisted intestine, if it's left, it could lead to his death. Right. And so if that had been the case, you need to answer the question, what if that had actually happened? Or what if this is going to happen? What, you know, and you actually have to work yourself through that scenario. Yeah. What this does is it helps you kind of get process through what's going on and able to clear your mind because now you've kind of worked through your fears. You're like the fearful thoughts. You've worked through possibilities, even as painful as, as they are, right? And then you're able to get to a place where the emotion kind of subsides because the emotion has to subside for you to shift it. Yeah. So the emotion kind of will run through you. It doesn't mean it's gone but it's kind of lessened a little bit. And then you can go into other ways of thinking about things. So you said you had some thoughts that brought you to a different place to help you take action. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things I also wanted to say is I tend to be the kind of person where my thoughts are often generated as questions. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed happens with me is that the questions aren't when they're not answered, they just continue in a void. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. Yes. So yes. if you're the same as me and you ask the fear-based questions, like it's very helpful as Carrie Ann says to answer those questions because mm -hmm. your brain is continually searching for an answer. Yeah, it is. It searches for an answer in your sleep. Yeah. It searches for an answer when you're not even realizing it. And so most people, it's, it's just kind of human nature to go, well, I don't know what would happen. I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. Uh -huh. You take a breath and you go, okay, brain, what if I didn't know? And sometimes we also avoid finding the answer because we don't want to answer it. We don't want to go there. Right. Yeah. So when your thoughts was, um, it's so unbearable, um, not knowing and, and what, what if we can't figure this out? How am I, I'm not going to be able to survive. Like, how am I going to be able to survive this? Right. You know, that you would survive. You just don't want to think about the pain that it's going to cause while you're surviving. Yeah. Right. And I think that this is just super, super important to acknowledge and face because until you face this stuff, you can't, move forward from it. It kind of keeps you stuck, mm -hmm. which is why it's important to answer the questions, to let yourself go there. And I'm going to give everybody tips like at the end. Yeah. Tips is such a terrible word, but I'm going to give you guys some ideas. Some strategies. Yeah. Some strategies. Yeah of, yeah. of some things that you can do when, when you're in this to kind of help you. Um, but this, this stage, this pro part of the process is really important. Okay. So, so, so then we were, you, you had asked me what were some of the kind of better thoughts that I have? Yeah. And they're not better or worse. Like yeah. we're not going to judge our thoughts, right? It's what, what are helpful. some different, more helpful thoughts that we can have that maybe help you do something to help. Right. So one of the thoughts I have is even though this totally sucks right now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have figured out situations like this before, and I will figure this one out. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, another thought that I have is um, as painful as the process is, we are just one doctor or one diagnostic test away from figuring this out. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. And so, you know, just pick either of those thoughts. I'm, do those thoughts create, generate the same emotion or feeling inside of you? Um, the, um, the thought that I have um, done this before and I can figure it out again, um, I, feel, I feel more confident. Okay. And the thought that we're just one test away or one doctor okay. away from figuring this out, it makes me hopeful. Okay. So the 
for me, those are two kind of separate two. things. Yeah. No, absolutely. And so let's go with the, uh, we're just one test away from figuring mm -hmm. it out. That's the one that, that makes you feel hopeful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So when you're feeling hopeful, how does that cause you to behave? What action or inaction do you take? It makes me very motivated to take an action to find that test mm -hmm. or find okay. that doctor. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And then you keep going and keep going. And then the result is that eventually we figure out what's figure going out. on. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. So this is important because once you can kind of process through those initial feelings and it does, and just so that people know, like once you go to that other thought that helps to keep you motivated, it doesn't mean that those other emotions aren't kind of sneaking in there. They are yeah. right. But you just have to kind of remind yourself and bring yourself back, which is why one of my favorite things to do is write that thought, the helpful thought on an index card, a post-it note, put it everywhere. Um, I used to go into my car to meltdown. <laughs> and cry. And that's where I would keep my post-it note to remind myself and allow myself to cry and then bring myself right back to the new, to this new perspective that gives me the energy to go, okay, here we go. Yeah. And, and you find, and so could you tell uh, what was the result? Like what was happening with your son? So, um, so what was happening with my son is that he had, um, multiple impacted teeth. And even though we take him to the dentist on a regular basis and all of that, um, it's not something that was, um, it, it's not something that someone can figure out on a, like an eyeball exam. Um, and it was very frustrating because I took him to the ER at our local hospital and you know, they basically said, I don't know, you know, maybe this is just some leftover pain mm -hmm. from an ear infection that he had a couple of weeks ago. I mean, they were giving me like all kinds of stories Everything. that just didn't even make any sense. And I said to them, I really think it's his teeth. Like when you, when you know your child, especially if your child is nonverbal, like mine is, you become very aware of, mm -hmm. you know, small ways that they move their body and ways that they communicate that are nonverbal. And like, I could tell that like, anytime we touched his mouth or, you know, he, he kind of indicated in his way that like, that's kind of where the pain was coming from. Right. Um, on right. his communication device, he kept saying, my face hurts. And we didn't, we didn't understand that when you have impacted teeth, like you feel it in your sinuses. So like, right. I didn't, I didn't know how to interpret that information. Right. Um, and so anyway, um, so they basically told me to go pound sand and that I had something to do with this ear infection. And I literally, because I was having these thoughts of like, I think I know what's wrong mm -hmm. and I think I know what test he needs, but mm -hmm. no one is helping me, which is like another right. thought that I have when this is right. going on. It's, right. it's like rage that no one is mm -hmm. helping because they're not listening to me and they're not listening to me talk about what I know is going on with him. And it's just infuriating to me. But mm -hmm. anyway, so when, when, um, when they told me to just buzz off, basically, I literally got him in the car and I drove him to another hospital that was like 10 miles away. Mm -hmm. And I said to them, like, I'm not leaving here until he gets a CT scan. I'm not leaving here. And um, it took him like 10 hours to get us the CT scan because they had to sedate him because mm -hmm. there's this really crazy thing. It's very hard to get images of children who were in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. And who, you know, he's got a movement disorder, so he can't mm -hmm. say still. So the whole, like, I, we had to get him sedated first, which okay. took a long time. And then he got the diagnostic test. But yes, the CT scan showed that he had multiple impacted teeth. So I brought the CT scan to his dentist the next day, and he was scheduled for oral surgery, and they removed multiple teeth. So that's what it was. And, you know, so, and, and so we did end up getting through it. And, you know, that pain that he had was like super justified. And now I know, I mean, not mm -hmm. that he needed to be justified, but no, now right. I know why he right. was having that pain. And because of it's, it's funny, the rage thoughts actually <laughs> were helpful mm -hmm. <laughs> because I got so mad 
that I got so mad that it actually propelled me yes. to action. Yes. And so that's one of the things I'm glad you brought that up is because people sometimes perceive rage as being a negative emotion. In this case, it was a very helpful emotion for you. Um, and in my own experience, I've ha happened to have a lot of medical, weird medical things and my daughter as well. Um, it took getting to that point where you're enough is enough. Yeah. For people to take notice. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, um, as parents, we defer to doctors, right? We defer to medical professionals, even though in our gut, we know something's wrong. Yeah. And we can see it. And so good for you for just pushing. And I, I, I think that that is really important that you, that you know when enough is enough and when it's time to evoke mama bear, <laughs> like sincerely, like I'm not leaving till I get this done. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But processing through that first part of it is really important and helpful for you to get to that, to the next part that helps you. And that's where you got to, which is exactly what you needed to get to. Yeah. Right. And so if people have not, you know, one of the things that you said is that, is that we've been through this before. I think in my own experience uh, with my daughter, the first time is almost like the hardest time because you don't have that past experience. Totally agree. Totally yeah, agree. Do not have that past experience to, um, to, to fall back on. And so in that circumstance, when you don't have a past experience, process through what you're going through and then try to come up with thoughts that are going to help give you hope and confidence. Yeah. Like for me, in hindsight, I would have pushed harder earlier but I had never been through this before. And she couldn't talk at that point. She couldn't give us, tell us what was going on. All we knew is that she was screaming and we kept doing x-rays and the doctors were listening to us. They just couldn't find out what was wrong. It took a yeah. year. Went through the screaming every night, 10 hours a night for a year. And that's when we discovered that her spinal cord was being stretched and it was nerve pain and nerve damage, which is why we had to catheterize her, which the doctor had said, if we had not caught it, when we did, she would have been paralyzed. Oh my gosh. So then you have, so this is the second part of this. And maybe some people watching can relate. Then you have the regret of why didn't I push harder earlier? Uh -huh. So that's something else I wanted to bring up is one of the things that this situation creates sometimes in us as parents is I should have done. It's like, you know, the Monday morning quarterback. I should have done this instead of that. I should have done this sooner. I should have gone to that doctor instead. And it's all the should haves. Uh -huh. And that can also really impact what's going on with you emotionally, right? Afterwards. And that can, so I would really encourage people to work through and really get logical about the should haves because you don't know, you didn't know if you would have known you would have done it. Right. And just remember for next time. One of the things that I wanted to bring up about like say memories, because it's like, this just happened to me recently where we had to go through some stuff with my daughter and he had us remember back when she was little. And it, my entire day was blown after that. Like I was just wrapped in this like 20 years of awful memories. And then I realized I had to retell the story because I was choosing to focus on all of the things we missed and all of the hardship we went through and wasn't focused on how far we've come mm -hmm. and what we've learned, right? And we're, regardless of what the outcome is, people, even with worst case scenarios, people who have had children pass away, there are still positive things about when that child was alive and in your life and the love and all the experiences and they're always gonna be a part of you. And you have to reach for it sometimes because you don't want the bad results to have happened, but to keep moving forward in your life, remember there are two stories to the same story. Yeah. Right. There are two versions. Usually there is even more than two versions of the story. And I think that's really important for people to try and remember as they're working through all of this. And frankly, you, if you hadn't been through what you've been through, 
and what you are going through, you wouldn't be helping all these people. And so something good is coming out of it, right? Because you're helping so many people. Yeah. And I noticed that, um, you know, what's wonderful to see is that a lot of people in the audience, like, uh, you know, if they're in Facebook groups um, with other parents of children with special needs mm-hmm. that, you know, one of those parents may say, hey, you know, my child's been doing X, Y, and Z. We can't figure out what's wrong. And so many parents collaborate and, you know, say, well, mm-hmm. you know, I would check this or this is what was going on with my child. And right. so, you know, anybody listening can share their wisdom. I mean, all of our experiences are written in blood. Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, um, so participating in some of that is another great way to give meaning to this terrible experience that right. you went through. Right, right, exactly. And something else I just wanted to share was working through, like working through memories and working through hard times that you've had in the past, kind of going through the process that you and I just went through and writing down kind of like how you got to where, like how you got yourself out of it so that you can reflect and remember, because in the moment, sometimes it's hard to remember. It is. And a lot of times we shy away from writing, writing about or journaling the horrible things that we're going through. But if you know that you can use that potentially in the future to help you, that will help you emotionally and kind of even planning ahead. Yeah. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but Sincerely, if you can come up ahead of time before everything gets kind of turned upside down. Yeah. And so that you can bring yourself back and remind yourself to help you get through it. Like that is, at least for me, that's something that really worked. And I know for a lot of the people that I help, that helps them as well. Yeah. Um, So like you say, these, you're going to have these fear thoughts and sad thoughts and all of this stuff as these issues happen. But giving kind of equal airtime to yeah. some of the thoughts that you've identified that have been helpful before will make that process less painful. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Because we're not trying to eliminate the pain because it's appropriate. Yeah. It's appropriate to feel all the things that you felt, all the things that I felt, all the things that people watching are feeling like that's totally appropriate but we need to process through it so we can, so that we can generate moving forward, generate action. Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons why we need to address it, work through it so that we can move forward and, and get answers. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, in, in addition to that, and I'm sure that, you know, a lot of people, I I hope a lot of people, people do this, you're writing down and keeping track of all this stuff, meaning all your medical stuff. One of the things that I have found these last 20 years (laughs) is I come in, I mean, Katie's medical thing is like, it's like huge, right? Um, It's actually ridiculous. I have all her medical records, but I actually have pages and pages and pages of dates, times, symptoms, medications, experiences, all like in an Excel sheet. So when I go into the doctor now, and I'm like, something is wrong and they dismiss me, here you go. And so they can see that I'm not just some, cause you know, I used to, especially when I was younger, I got kind of blown off. Oh, you're a first time mom, you know, oh, you're just worried, you know, and sometimes we can be dismissed. And so when you come in with evidence, when you come in with, Hey, this has been the pattern and this is what I've experienced. And this is this, and it's very concrete with dates and very concrete outcomes, it will help your case. That's great advice. Yeah. And, and that's for medical issues. That's for neuro, uh, you know, neurodiverse diagnosis as well. Uh, because, um, you know, those are two kind of different beasts per se, Mm -hmm. because one is very physically medical and one is, uh, cognitive, Mm -hmm but they're both just as important and they're both just as hard sometimes to get doctors to pay attention and help you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a really, that's a really helpful tip. Yeah. Even if your child is, you know, doing better and you think that, Oh, we're past it because you know, that does happen, especially like say with the neuro uh, diverse types of diagnosis, you think, Oh, my child is 15 now 
and he or she's doing much better. I'm good. And then you get rid of stuff because you want to put it behind you. Don't do that. (laughs) Bring it back out of the trash, out of the recycle, (laughs) put it somewhere because you don't know what's going to happen in the future. And I'm not like trying to be like a doomsday person. I'm just saying it's always better to be prepared. Yeah. No, that's really good advice. Yeah. Yeah. And I learned that the hard way. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There was a year that I thought that things had turned and were different and they, they were for about a year and then things turned again. So that is something I wish somebody had told me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, this is somewhat similar, but, um, well, we keep a, we keep a log every day of Mm -hmm. my son. It's got a checklist with all of his Mm -hmm. things, but it also has, you know, basically notes that we take about things that happened that day. And, um, one of the things we couldn't figure out, but eventually discovered through this was that, um, whenever he had his feeding tube changed, he would, um, sort of coincidentally start having more seizures within mm-hmm. the next, you know, few days following his tube change. And, um, we figured out that we figured out that the feeding tube change slowed his motility and interrupted like the uptake oh, of his right. seizure meds. And so now there's something we can do about it, but like you really are a detective in some ways Mm -hmm. and you have to keep the data so that you can kind of go back and reconstruct what happened. Like we all think our memories, oh, like I'll definitely remember this, but you you don't. don't. And so keeping, keeping some kind of log or journal or something Mm -hmm. like that is really helpful. It really is. And that's also, that's what helps the doctors. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Like we think that doctors is a reason why they call it the art of medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Because it's, it's fluid. And so we, I think sometimes expect doctors to just kind of know Yeah, and they're human beings like we are. Yep. Right. And so if we, the more information we can give them, the more patterns we can, we can kind of like recognize and communicate the better off we're going to be, I think in the end, getting our kids the help that they need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if people want to learn more about you or work with you, what Mm -hmm. is the best way for them to contact you? So the easiest way is just to email me. It's Carrie Ann at CarrieLifeCoaching.com. And I know you're going to put it in the notes. I also have a website, um, CarrieLifeCoaching.com. And that's how they can kind of learn more and reach out and just, uh, yeah. I also wanted to offer if people see this and they want to give life coaching a shot, if you just want like one session, I'm willing to do one free session for anybody that references that you've seen this or any of Laura's, um, YouTube podcast or not the series, YouTube series. Yeah. 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 And, And I'll give them a free session because it's amazing just how, processing through, you know, one experience can really help set you up for future. It's so true. Yeah. I couldn't recommend it more. And like you said, I will link to everything below. So thank you so much for walking us through this really painful and challenging um, scenario and circumstance. And I think this is going to really help a lot of people. I hope so. Thank you. All right. You're welcome.